Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending another episode of Ashley Randolph Show. I have an amazing guest, as always. This time, I have Dr. Susan. Is that okay if I call mm -hmm. you that? Yeah. Dr. Susan. She is phenomenal. So phenomenal that, you know, she has an amazing book I'm going to share with you all and some wonderful, wonderful stories and experiences that she can share with all of us. So just in case you don't know, Dr. Susan, um, we do have an audience worldwide right now. We're majorly in America and Germany, Switzerland, and I believe the Philippines is what just popped up. We have a large audience there. And we're about 50, 50% 50 families and healthcare professionals. So you're speaking to a whole crowd. Um, just be you like you have been. And I, your background is amazing. So let me just say that first. And it's really, really soothing for me to see. So um, I'm going to go ahead and fly my wings on this episode. <laughs> and I'm going to share a little video before we talk to you of something that you have said before. And I saw this online and I said, oh, wow everyone should hear this. So I'm going to go ahead and share it. We work so much and we miss so much. We want to be involved in everything they do, but we all love medicine and we love our jobs and we love taking care of other people, but we also want to take care of our kids. And so we're in a position, our whole careers to not be good enough because we're doing other things besides being a mom. Here today, um, please introduce yourself and tell us about your book. That's the Ashley, best Actually, it is my privilege to be on your show. I love everything you're doing. I just told you I could talk to NICU moms all day long. I always found it so comforting to talk mom to mom with the NICU moms. And even though I became a neonatologist before I became a mom, becoming a mom and going into premature labor with my first one at 25 weeks gestation was a great thing that happened to me because I learned how truly helpless and how frightening uh, uh, an abnormal pregnancy a threatened premature delivery is. And it made me see how moms who are desperately trying to have a baby, families who are trying to get through a pregnancy, how important the whole situation in and around the NICU really is. I um, was able to, um, well, they held off my premature labor. I was on lots of medicines and steroids, of course, and I didn't deliver until 35 weeks gestation. And my son was fine. He was not ill at all. Um, he even breastfed really well. My second two children, both girls were full term and I was really lucky, but I still love talking to NICU moms in the nursery because we all shared the same desires to have a healthy baby, to bring a child into the world and to be the best mother we possibly can be. Yeah. So I, I trained in Houston, Texas uh, at Texas Children's Hospital in neonatology. And I worked there for the first eight years. I met my husband there and we were married and had three children. We, uh, so I was in academic medicine there at the beginning of my career. Then we moved to Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas. Arkansas Children's Hospital is a wonderful children's hospital. It's catchment for the whole state of Arkansas. And they have a huge NICU, two, two or three huge NICUs in that city. And it was so interesting to go from one NICU in a big city to one, another NICU in a smaller city yeah. and to see the differences and to get used to new people and a new culture because each NICU does has, have its own kind of little family ideas and its little cultural notions. Mm -hmm. After seven years in Arkansas, when our children were still pretty young, um, so 
7, 10, and 13, we moved to Austin, Texas, which is where I worked for the next 25 years. I joined Pediatrics Medical Center. It's a national group of neonatologists and high-risk perinatal docs. Uh, all across the country, many of your listeners have had contacts with pediatrics physicians and had babies in a NICU that pediatrics took care of. And what I really loved about my work at pediatrics was they did research, even though they're in private practice, they did research, they did quality improvement. They always struggled to make things best for the families, not just best for the babies, but best for the families. And so that company was a great company to work for. Now it was different being in private practice than it was in academic medicine. But at the same time, I got to do some things with the American Academy of Pediatrics, representing neonatology, representing NICU. Because general pediatricians don't think much about the NICU. It's really us neonatologists and NICU nurses and high-risk OBs that really focus on that area. So I got to participate in the American Academy of Pediatrics push to uh, improve breastfeeding rates. Their push to have moms express their breast milk in the NICU for their babies. And finally, most recently, their push to have donor human milk available for all NICU babies. We finally made it. We finally made it. Um, So I've had a long career, 35 years. I've gotten to see wonderful, wonderful things. And of course, some things that were not so wonderful. Infant loss, um, perinatal loss is never easy. Yeah. Um, But looking back, I think my career was the most fulfilling thing I've ever done right up there with being a mom to three children. The clip, the clip you played, I was talking with Allie um, Novitsky. She has a podcast about female physicians. And we were talking about the struggle that, that doctors and nurses have to be great healthcare providers, to take care of other people, to swoop in and make things better and use treatment and use medicine. And at the same time, we also carry around with us this need to be good parents, good mothers. And I think anybody that loves children, whether it's their own or, or some that they know or take care of, wants to do both things. And I felt like in my career, Ashley, I could take care of children that were sick and take care of my own (laughs) children. And I really love doing both. Um, Some would say I burnt my candle at both ends, but I did raise three kids. I had a great husband helper and he was also a physician. And I'm just so fortunate that I've had such a great career. And recently I've been talking about the things that I learned through that long career, the things that will help other people. was important yes so yes, I, I know you have a book and it's called so many babies right yes so many babies my life balancing a medical career with motherhood mm-hmm. I wanted to tell the story of the NICU what the NICU is really like mm-hmm. how hard it is how hard it is on the babies on the moms on the dads on the nurses respiratory mm-hmm. therapists us you know it's just 24 seven. It is mm-hmm. one place on earth that is 24 seven. I guess it's like the ER in that respect. 
And yeah. I told stories of my favorite patients, my favorite parents, those who taught me lessons about being courageous, being inspiring, being uh, some even being difficult and, you know, yeah. having their own opinions about things. And um, <laughs> so the stories are meant to describe what life is like in the NICU. And I wove along with those stories, my mom's stories, how I learned to be a better mother, how I learned to take care of my children, even though I was in the hospital 50 or 60 hours a week sometimes. Wow. And the very best of times I was in the hospital 40 hours a week. Um, okay. And, you know, and we take night calls. Y'all know mm -hmm. if you've had a baby in the NICU, the doc and the nurse is up at night. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. it's, it's no cakewalk uh, taking care of children in the NICU. So I would come home tired and sleepy and had to learn how to take care of myself and be present for my children. And I think that that is what a lot of moms are going through right now. You know, we hear a lot right now about working mom burnout and mm -hmm. parent burnout. We're all struggling so much to be the best workers we can be. If we like our job, that's icing on the cake, but we still want to do a good job, but we also want to be the best parent we possibly can be. And so I think the stories in my book are meant to be reassuring to mm -hmm. other working parents. It, it's meant to tell a tale of a medical doctor who was also a mom, but when some of my nurse friends read it, they said, oh, my God, I went through exactly the same thing. Yeah. And I said, I know, because that's what moms have been telling me for 30 years. We all go through the same things, whether we have a healthy child or a sick child. Now, moms of NICU babies go through way, way more bad stuff than moms mm -hmm. of healthy babies. But the struggles to be the best mother we can be for our mom, our universal. Yes. And I will tell you that um, I struggled with that. So when I had my first child, Aiden, I didn't go back to pursue being a doctor, specifically an OBGYN, mm -hmm. because I was scared of the work hours. Mm -hmm. But then I started this nonprofit and it blossomed so much. And I find myself sometimes doing 40 to 50 hours because we have a 24 um, seven call number. So wow. I can get a call at 11 PM, you know, and I'm on it on a calls trying to make connections for three hours. So it yeah. happens <laughs> all the time. And um, so I feel like I still kind of have that schedule. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I totally understand where, you know, balancing everything and I still have my three kids too, which is another reason why I had to have you on here today. Oh. Because you have three, I have three. You already went through it and you mastered it. Um, I'm I'm hoping that I've have mastered mine, but I there's a little room still, you know, I'm trying to iron out. But mm -hmm. besides that, you know, I think I'm doing way better. I'm getting my weekends back which good, is something right. I haven't had in like eight years. So huh. I'm That's literally, good. yeah, I'm trying to at least get my weekends back to start there and then doing things with my kids in return. So um, here's something you may be proud of. So I haven't really went on vacation with my kids in about two or three years now. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm always working. Um, when people go on vacations, I'm like, why are you going on vacation? You, you know, you have something to do. but um, last week I got invited by the Sacramento Kings and the River Cats to go to the River Cats last game. Nice. It was on a Wednesday. The kids have school, but they're all straight A students and report cards come out this Friday. So I went ahead and took them out of school for a day. I just got on my computer and canceled everything that day. They gave me eight tickets. It's a, we're a family of five and we all went. Oh, and wow. London caught a ball, my second child. She caught one of the balls. Oh, Aiden amazing. got to meet uh, Barry Bonds um, and get autographs from all the players. And ironically, the Kings had just bought the River Cats. So this was their first time announcing it. Oh, done disappeared. Uh -huh. 
It was the first time announcing it. So I was proud of myself for that. Yeah, and you should be. That's the kind of thing that children love. And and that will be a special memory for you and for them forever. Forever. I used to come home and play baseball in the backyard or t-ball with my kids or go down to the neighborhood swimming pool. When we lived in Little Rock, um, there was a great big neighborhood full of children and they remember those times they don't remember when I was gone at night in the hospital on call yes they remember when I was home when we were doing things together Um, and so this constant um, attempt to balance your work and being a mom is something that is universal for those of us who work full-time I don't think it's really a balance all the time. I think it's kind of picking and choosing what you're Mm going to focus on. And if I'm resuscitating a baby with septic shock and I've got parents to talk to and I'm going to be up all night and then I've got a partner to check out with in the morning, when I get home the next day, I've got to tell my kids so that they can understand to some degree how tired mommy is. And after a nap, I've got to do something with my children. And all of us face challenges in our work or challenges with our children that then pull at us when we're doing the opposite thing. And so what I found in my life, Ashley, was actually saying, okay, now I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to try to put the other aside just for a minute. And when I get home, I'm going to focus on them. And so my life was really, when I was not in the hospital, it was really all about family. And you cannot go wrong if that's the way you play it. Okay. Thank you for that. You you cannot go wrong. Like you said, your book is a reassurance that (laughs) what you're doing is right. Here's your reassurance so I love the book um I do plan on getting some for the holiday season because we always do care boxes for our families and um this year we will do some for healthcare professionals so I will get some um thank you for that before we go to the next question do you want to tell people really quick where they can find your book Oh, yes. I'm listed on Amazon and all the independent bookstores, bookshop, et cetera. But my website is susanlandersmd.com. And you can get my book there. I also have a blog for parents. And I have a newsletter that I have started a few months back. And I love that because I'm sharing working mom experiences with other uh, mothers. So my website, SusanLandersMD.com, is the best place to go to get more information about my book, about my blog, about my newsletter. And I just have loved resources on my website for parents. In fact, I'll tell you a secret. I have an ebook ready to be released, and it's all about late preterm babies. Those of us who have had a 34 or 35 weeker, even 36 weeker, we know they Mm -hmm. don't act like full-term babies. Mm -hmm. They don't breathe right. They don't eat right. (laughs) They they fall asleep when they're eating. They are, you know, sometimes you have to measure everything you feed them or triple feed them. Mm -hmm. And so any of us who've had a late preterm baby know that there are certain things we have to do and watch out for. And I've written an ebook to help parents just for that population, late preterm infants. And I'm going to release it in the next month. And so your readers may want to um, look out for that. I don't have it available on my website yet but I'm going to, and I just feel certain that it will answer so many questions about that group of babies, 34, 35, 36 weekers. They are different. They do Mm -hmm. not act like full-term babies. 
They may go home in two or three days, but boy, they are, they can be little slugs. We all know that. They, they They're can be different. They're their own challenge, little world. Such a challenge. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Yay. Caring for late preterm babies. And then if you have a flyer, when it is coming out, send it to me. I'll make sure to share it. Oh, and I good. will put your website and all that information below in our description when right, I release right. this tomorrow. So good. N- no worries. Um, we're going to help, you know, showcase <laughs> you. Just send it my way. Um, I just love what you do. I love oh, what you have you. done, not just for your own family, but for probably thousands of other NICU families. I mean, over 25 years alone at one place, I, I can just imagine mm-hmm. um, how yeah. many preemies you really had, you know, a big impact in. And that that's like very tremendous on behalf of you and what you have gone through and still had three kids to grow up and be, I'm sure, wonderful children and adults now, I'm sure. Yes, they're all grown up. Yeah, Yeah. see, that's, I'm waiting on that part. <laughs> yeah, I'm halfway yeah. there. Just, just last week on Facebook, I saw a picture of three teenage girls who were triplets that I took care of. And I, I said to their mother, oh my God, they are so beautiful. I have not seen a picture of them in about five years. Wow. These were tiny little babies. 700 grams, 1,000 grams, 1,200 grams, IVF babies. Oh, they were in the hospital forever. Each one was sick and they all made it and they are all normal and beautiful. And I even wrote about that mom in my book because she actually raised money for another organization that supports premature parents of premature infants called hand to hold Mm -hmm. you might have heard of. i know them. we all in the work in the same group yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so the the mom of the triplets turned out to raise money for that group in austin yeah Yeah. Yeah, i know uh, that all are part of the it's called the national parent network now but we were all together when it was called the preemie parent alliance a national so, yeah. parent network. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's ran by Kira. She's amazing too. She's another um, preemie parent. Uh, she has an incredible story as well. And so it's a lot of us. Yeah. So I'm right along with are. them. We're up next society, hand to hold, uh, glow preemies. Um, they're Saul's light. They're based in New Orleans. They're for infant loss. Um, let's see. Preemie world. Yeah. Um, Deb DeCenza and I created the Alliance for Black NICU Families together. Wonderful. And so with that, we changed like a lot of laws and legislations. We're working on um, getting equitable health care training, making it mandated in every state right now. Um, we do our own researches. We have a breast pump program that we do Yay. for our hospitals. Yeah. Um, and we're doing, yeah, some some really cool stuff there. And Yeah, I know all of them. perplexed me about NICU care was that African-American mothers tended to be less informed about the benefits of breastfeeding. Oh, hundred percent. And tended to be less ready to express their milk over weeks and months. And people who mm-hmm. have done that know how hard it is to pump your breast milk six or eight times a day for weeks on end until your baby gets big enough to nurse. And I, I always wondered why that developed and why we have had to work so hard to convince African-American mothers that even using donor breast milk is the right thing for them. And I'm really glad that recently all of this information about 
formula feeding causing neck has mm-hmm. come out. And now the lawyers are talking about yeah. asking parents whether or not their child was harmed by given, mm-hmm. being given a formula instead of human milk. So Ashley, tell me what you think. Why, is, wh- why are the rates of breastfeeding and the rates of human milk expression still a little bit lower in African-American moms than they are in other races. So I can tell you that uh, specifically from, excuse me, my uh, current research we have done at CPQCC. So uh, with that research and my personal experiences with these families and in my own community, um, education is key, first of all. Um, Then you have to look at their life situation. Mm. Are they having to work in a warehouse? There's nowhere mm. to go pump at a warehouse. So wow. how can you pump eight hours a day? Um, or, you know, it, it may take eight them a long time yeah. to pump. So it may take a whole um, hour to pump for them to get a good amount. And then if it does, right, that's eight hours for them. Um, then you have to worry about where to store it. Then right. you have to talk about, are they on food stamps and things like that? Do they have certain qualifications that they have to make? Um, like here in California, you have to have a job. Um, they recently changed it a few years ago where I think the first mm. year after a baby, you don't have to go. But oh, before good. then, yeah. you still had to work, I think, 20 to 15 hours. So that was, you know, already doing so that. So economic issues that now, are affecting... Some, economics uh, education yeah Um, they give you the pamphlet but are they really sitting down and explaining to you why then you go to WIC so WIC will give you a breast pump that's loaned which you know a lot of moms are like "Eh," even though everything inside the cup and everything is clean and new they're still a little skeptical about you know borrowing it then they give you different options so let's say the WIC program, if you're doing breast milk, you get X, Y, and Z. But if you're doing formula, you get X, Y, and Z. And so it puts parents in the bind. Like my kids, um, right. Aiden came home on half formula, half breast milk to okay. gain weight. So right. I couldn't tell WIC to give me four cans of formula and I'll just supplement everything else. It was pick or choose. And you so. know, the other thing about WIC is it gives this subconscious message Mm -hmm. that formula is more important than breast milk because we're giving it to people we're saying here you need formula instead of saying here you need help to breastfeed your baby Mm -hmm. and here's why you might need to supplement with a little bit of formula they're getting the message that formula is better when in fact we know now that breast milk feedings the best. are way better than formula feeding. Mm-hmm. It's, so a, it's edu- like liquid gold. It it's is. Liquid so gold. education is crucial. You think mm-hmm. then that, I don't know. I and it's believe. also about where they live too. So uh-huh. if they live with, let's say it's them and their small kids and they live with grandma and auntie may stay there too. So right. there's no privacy for you to breastfeed for a long right. period of time either. So it's so many reasons. And the only way to fix it, like I always say is, uh, you have to fix the whole system, which is why I created Globe Premies to stay with families so long. I Good. even had someone who worked at a school. I won't mention the school name, but um, she did have a baby. She went back to work after six weeks. And she asked them, where can she breastfeed? And they told her to go to the utility closet. Oh, she can pump oh. in there. So, oh. you know, you know, she quit because she can't go in there and pump in a utility closet. No, absolutely not. So that's as no, bad as and, being told to pump in the bathroom. Absolutely. Oh. Right. And so oh. there's so many reasons and we all just have to come together and understand and make it also a cultural acceptable thing because right. mm-hmm. um, I always tell gentlemen, you know, if you see a woman breastfeeding, please don't give her like an eye or make any comments because then that distracts her and then she doesn't right. want to do it anymore, especially right. not right. in front of guys. So right. culturally, we all have to support 
breastfeeding too. So do. and dad, I think they too, should have like a rap song said. about it. They have rap yeah. songs for everything else. I think I've been waiting on somebody to make a rap song or a music song in R and B something that others can hear because well, music is very you know cultural we're very cultural with music yeah. so what a good idea music? we need to have yeah. we need to have a, a special a famous rapper who has a premature baby <laughs> absolutely and you know there's a lot of them I know them all nice I would love yeah. that because I would like a been celebrity I would like a celebrity who had preemies to recommend mm-hmm. my book that, that's what like I'm saying. That. People listen to celebrities. I, they you know, always do. They do. <laughs> always. So it's like, I'm here, I'm like fighting to make myself one in a sense, just so I could get people attention and say, hey, now let's go back to the important things because right. I've been right. trying to get a, um, now J.R. Smith, he's retired from the NBA. I do work closely with his wife. So they Good. had a preemie as well. So her organization is called My Coda Bear. So oh. um, I will be willing to uh, tell her about you and I'll tell her about your book. They do do care boxes. Nice. So nice. Um, I'll let That's her know so and see if I could connect you guys too. But yeah, you know, we have a lot of connections. You know, we talked before here and Great. I mean, I just can't believe you know, you know all about the donor human milk. I've been advocating for that for like two years now. One of the best jobs I ever had, it was an extra position. I worked as a medical director for the Austin Mother's Milk Bank. It had just started the year before, and I didn't know anything about human milk banking, donor milk banking. Then I went over there while I was practicing neonatology, and I think I worked for them five or six hours a week, you know, answering questions about donor screening and uh, what cultures in the milk, things like that. Uh, It wasn't difficult, but I learned a lot about it. And over the years that I served on the board of directors for that milk bank for a while, and over the years in Texas, of all places, we managed to get Texas Medicaid to cover donor human milk use in the NICU. And any parent listening that's trying to get donor human milk covered for their baby, there is precedent for Medicaid to pay for this. Mm-hmm. And it's needed. Yes. Yeah. It's very Finally. needed. Finally. So that was a fun thing to be part of. That was great. I, I'm so happy. Um, I can't even tell you how excited that makes me. I work with like Prolacta Bioscience for Good. their um, donor human milk. Um, I, I believe in it. You know, I'm a true yeah. advocate for it. You know, I really hope that we can get to the point where formula is secondary. It's, it's not our first option, you know. Exactly. Um, the liquid Good. gold is best. So I'm so, so happy we talked about that today. Um, anything else you had in mind about you mentioned it earlier about NICUs being in different states and they're all having their own different culture and feel inside of there. Do you have any favorites? And could you tell me why it was your favorite NICU that you have seen throughout your whole experience? I'm sure you have a few. Yeah, my, my favorite was at Texas Children's, but it was a smaller unit then it was a 30 bed unit and now I think it's 60 or 80 or something huge and I think the culture was the nurses and the physicians together and they and we developed a nurse practitioner program within that culture you know some neonatologists were not they didn't like the idea of working with neonatal nurse practitioners Parents who have babies in the NICU love working with neonatal nurse practitioners because they take more time with the parents than the neos do. They explain things in more general terms, I think. And they're basically nurses to start with. 
we're physicians. We're supposed yeah, yeah, to, you yes, know, yeah. make the diagnosis, get the treatment, get out the medicine, do the thing. And that's really wonderful. And we even know now, Ashley, that men and women physicians practice differently in the way they explain things and the time they take with a parent or a patient. And so I think a unit that has a good solid core of NICU nurses, they, they work together, they've been together, they like their structure, they have, whether it's a charge nurse or supervisor or whatever, they like the neonatal nurse practitioners, they like the neos, and they all share the work. A good unit, I think, can be determined, you can, you can determine whether a unit is good by the sense of teamwork that people have in it. If I want to run a code, I have got to have the respiratory therapist, the nurse practitioner, the NICU nurse, the resident, the what I cannot run a code by myself of a chronic lunger who's still on the vent and needs steroids and he's just aspirated. It reminds me of this horrible, horrible situation where a young nurse who was inexperienced was was a sign of a very sick chronic lunger and she i don't know how on god's earth this happened but she put formula down the endotracheal tube and that baby <gasps> gasped and choked and coughed and coded and the mother was at the bedside and I ran over, I was in the on call, I think it was four or five in the afternoon. I ran over and, you know, we got everybody together and we did the code and we sucked out the endotracheal tube and brought the baby back with medicines. He didn't need much. One of the nurses said, Dr. Landers, don't you want the mom to leave? And I said, no, I want the mom to stay. I want her to know how much we love this baby and how hard we're working. And the mom sat there. She didn't want to leave. She was watching us. She had been one, one of those moms who wasn't very trustful. Okay. She, didn't quite, she hadn't yet quite trusted everybody because her baby had had some complications. Mm -hmm. And allowing her to sit there and watch the code. And we worked on her son over an hour easily. Mm -hmm. And he finally, we got him back. We got him back down on his oxygen and his settings. And he was fine. And I asked her later, I said, did that scare you? And she said, no, that made me feel really good about where he is. And I said, thank you for telling us that. Oh, okay, thank you for telling me that. <laughs> that's what I wanted her to get. Mm -hmm. I wanted her to know that the whole team was caring for her baby. Oh, I love that story. I haven't told anybody that story in a long Ooh, time. It was a horrible thing down. that happened. I know. It was, I mean, I cannot believe a, a young nurse could do that. But, you know, crap happens in the NICU and we have to be honest about it mm -hmm. and we have to do the best we can and try to prevent errors whenever we can. Yeah, and just, just learn from, you know, past mistakes like, we learn right. in kindergarten. Oh, yeah. All right, right. Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing that story. That was very touching, I must say. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So how old do you think the baby was when it was finally discharged? Because I know you uh, said the mom had trusting in the beginning yeah, and then she yeah. saw this moment. So this happened when he was probably two or three months in. Okay. He's probably a 26, 27, 28 weeker. He's a tiny baby, a little white baby. And, you know, they're always thicker than black babies. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Um, and, yeah, what do the nurses call them? Wimpy white boys. And oh so my. he, they, have you not heard that before? No, I've never That's heard That's what the that. nurses call them. They call them oh, no, wimpy white man. boys because they're always so much thicker and the black kids are always so much stronger than the white yeah. kids. Well, that's um, so funny. <laughs> so that little, that little guy was probably in the hospital five or six months, but he went home, okay. not on oxygen. He did great. Yay. He did great. Kudos uh, to was, you and your team. 
Yes. And you know, the one thing, Ashley, since I retired a few years back, the one thing that I miss the most Mm -hmm. is teamwork. I miss being part of a great team because no one in medicine, no matter where you work, can do it alone. Mm -hmm. No doctor, no nurse, no administrator, no manager, no therapist can do their job alone. Maybe if you're in an office, out in the boonies, you can do your job alone, but even those practitioners have nurses to help them. Mm -hmm. I think teamwork is just the holy grail of NICU care. Yeah, and I totally agree. And having parents part of that team. I have not harped on that quite enough, Mm -hmm. you know. So I'm old fashioned because I've been in the business a while. And when we Mm -hmm. started allowing parents to listen in on rounds, I was skeptical that it would be a good idea. I thought, well, maybe they're going to hear some things they don't want to hear. Maybe they're going to hear some terms they don't understand. And they did. And they had a lot of questions. But parents told me that they liked hearing our rounds our bedside mm-hmm. rounds because they liked the back and forth they liked yes. hearing how we made decisions mm-hmm. and they liked including them in mm-hmm. what was going on and yeah. so I came around to the current way that NICUs make rounds which is to include parents mm-hmm. I'm going to charge my charger real quick okay um I totally agree. And at Stanford, I want to say that is one of the things we're working on is making sure that new doctors come in and understand that parents are a part of the team. They're not separate. Mm -hmm. So I love that you said that. Parents are crucial. I mean, if you didn't have a mom and a dad to do kangaroo care, to do skin to skin holding, that baby would not get well as quickly. I mean, Mm -hmm. babies, Babies need human touch. Babies yep. need their parents. Kangaroo care it, and so breast important. milk are two things that only mom can do. Yes. Nobody else can do it. I can't do it. The nurse can't do it. It's, it's, it's that link between mm-hmm. the baby, the child, and the baby's parent that is so crucial. And it's such a part of the child's healing. It really, mm-hmm. really is. Absolutely. And that's why um, I didn't get to tell everyone in the audience, but I have my daughter superstar cup today because I always say neonatologists, NICU nurses, the whole NICU staff, they're the superstars. And I Aww. actually, um, I think I did a blog or it could have been a podcast recently, but I said, you know, I sometimes give healthcare professionals a hard time because I'm an advocate for equitable care, healthcare. Right. But at right. the same time, they're the angels that are there with our babies when we're going to take that hour nap or when we're going downstairs to just grab something to eat. They're right. still there keeping an eye on our baby. So those are our angels. And we're just, you know, Thank trying you. to help the ones who need a little extra teaching. Those are the ones we want to help. But right, I right. always tell families, not all of them are bad. And, <laughs> you know, some of them have a heart of gold, like you, Dr. Susan, you, you, you saw what went wrong and you came right in, like you said, with the story and you saved that baby, you mm-hmm. and your team. And I love right. how you kept reinforcing that my team, my team, teamwork. Yeah. And so that's what it's all about creating your team and making sure it's very strong. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Susan. Um, I know we talked longer than our 30 minute scheduled (laughs) interview, but that usually happens. I had one that was like two hours long before. So um, I do want to have you back when your ebook does come out. All right. I had three kids that were, of course, two 34 weekers and one 36 weekers. So please reach out to me when it comes out. Send me oh, a flyer. I would love to. Good. Um, I'll make sure to send you this episode when I upload it. And I'm going to include all your information below. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with the audience? I want to tell NICU parents that are listening that what they are going through or have been through in my view, is one of the greatest challenges of a lifetime. And that 
when they are scared and when they're uncertain and when they feel weak and when they're frightened, all of that is normal. And we all go through that. We all go through a terrible amount of emotional trauma when we have a baby in the NICU, whether your child is there for a week or for six months. What you are doing as a parent of a baby in the NICU is so important. Your courage, your presence, your love, your voice, your touch is so important for your child and for that whole NICU team that I just want you to know that you, as a NICU parent, you have been chosen to be strong for those around you. And I really believe that. That was so beautiful. Oh my goodness. See, when I find somebody to make a rap song <laughs> or, a, <laughs> or a singer song, I think I'm going to call you to write the lyrics. And okay. then, <laughs> it, it'll be fine. Oh my goodness. Thank you. That was beautifully said. Um, that touched my heart. It really did um, as a NICU parent. So Thank you for everything you do, Dr. Susan. And I can't wait to have you on the next episode. Thanks, Ashley. You take care. You too. Bye.